What's going on internet? IG back again today and it is with great pleasure that we are going to have a look back through time at why Linux Mint is so popular. To me Linux Mint has always held a special place in my heart and today's video is going to be all about tripping on that nostalgia cord all the way home as we look at some of the landmark releases of Linux Mint and see what it brought to the table, what made this distribution so special, what makes it so special and why it's claimed such a significant market share of the Linux desktop. So starting out with Linux Mint 5, 5.0. Uh, I believe the code name was Elisa, and it was based on Ubuntu Hardy Heron 8.04. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to fly through some of these uh, distributions uh, of Linux Mint as uh, as time went on, and I'm going to highlight a couple of things that were introduced at different points. What these brought to the table in their time period and in the context that they came out. So I guess first of all it's worth mentioning what exactly uh, Linux Mint decided to do when they first launched their project. Now Linux Mint as a project I believe first came out in 2004? Basically Linux Mint started mucking around with Ubuntu as soon as Ubuntu became available to muck around with in some form or other. But I definitely would argue that it wasn't until Linux Mint 5, the long-term support release of Ubuntu, uh, of which it was based on, uh, that people really started to sit up and notice what was going on with Linux Mint. So first of all, let's kind of recap. What were some of the goals and what are the goals of the Linux Mint project as they stand today? Well, according to their website, uh, the purpose of Linux Mint is to produce a modern, elegant and comfortable operating system, which is both powerful and easy to use. Linux Mint is one of the most popular desktop Linux distributions and is used by millions of people. Uh, it, it works out of the box. It's extremely easy to use. It's free of cost and open source. It's community driven and it's based on Debian and Ubuntu, provides about 30,000 packages. It's meant to be safe and reliable and it has a conservative approach to software updates, a unique update manager and the robustness of the Linux architecture. Linux Mint requires very little maintenance and by that they mean no regressions, no antivirus, no anti spyware etc. Now that is uh, that were the goals of the Linux Mint project and still are. And if I could point to one distinguishing factor that points to Linux Mint as a shining beacon of hope in the desktop Linux world, it would be consistency is the name of the game. I Right now I am looking at a distribution that came out in 2008, uh, shortly after Ubuntu came out. And yet, you can still get a distribution of Linux Mint today, which looks and functions basically the same. To me, Linux Mint holds uh, the community, the voice of the community uh, in the forefront. Now that's not to say that they haven't made missteps and mistakes along the way. We'll get to those. But I think Linux Mint and specifically Linux Mint 5 emerged on the scene as a distribution with its own unique vision of where it wanted to take desktop Linux to try and make it more user friendly and more accessible to those who are wanting to try out Linux on the desktop. So. The interesting part for me also is when it comes to donations and sponsorships of this distribution, it's very easy to map its growth uh, as, as, a, as a Linux desktop that was gaining market share. When, the ver when version 2.1 came out, which I believe was in 2006, there was, only, there was about roughly $500 of, of sponsorships and monthly donations. By the time we get to uh, Linux Mint 5, which is what I have here in 2008, so only two years later, we were sitting at about $1,100 in monthly sponsorships and donations. So what did Linux Mint 5 bring to the table that was turning so many heads back in 2008? Well, first of all, um, it came in two different uh, flavors. It came in the main edition and the light edition. The main edition was based on GNOME and the light edition was a, a far more stripped back version for older hardware. It was still a very young distribution and it was uh, it was still uh, in a lot of reviewers opinions still trying to rub off that scathing remark of oh it's just another Ubuntu spin or it's just uh, Ubuntu with a different with a green coat of paint. What this distribution actually did was very different for its time. It provided a very Windows-esque menu. It gave you codecs and it gave you flash and it gave you access easy access to um, to restricted drivers and it gave you a software portal for easy installation of different packages. Take note, this is the beginning of the Mint install software manager. 
So by going to the Linux Mint software portal back in the day, you were able to browse through a website, a web portal basically of packages and the web portal served as the software manager uh, for Linux Mint. Obviously you could also install apt packages from the Ubuntu repositories and you also had a quick link to the get deb.net site as well. Again, most of these uh, relied on web portals to install the software that you were looking for. Also, it introduced an update manager, which gave users a lot more granular control and allowed, allowed users to be a lot more conservative when it came to updating their system. And it did this by ranking the updates in terms of how uh, potentially dangerous they were in terms of the system stability, and it gave users the option to choose whether or not to install them. This was pretty revolutionary for its time. So it definitely started to turn some heads. Over the following year, development would really ramp up and we would land in my, personal first Linux distribution that I ever installed on native hardware, and that was Linux Mint 8. So Linux Mint 8 was released right at the end of 2009, and it was based on Ubuntu 9.10 Karmic Koala. Now, uh, Linux Mint 8 for me holds a very special place because it was my first Linux distribution that I actually installed on native hardware. And, uh, and it, it gave the user a very, very polished GNOME 2.28 release, it, and it actually integrated a lot of useful desktop features as well. So again, the theme here being that GNOME hadn't changed a whole lot, and they were able, the Mint team, as developed was ramping up, they were now receiving about $1,700 uh, a month in sponsorships and donations, and uh, they were able to add a lot more spit and polish to their desktop and their suite of tools. And trust me, this is going to become the uh, the staple. This is going to become one of the telltale calling cards of the Linux Mint desktop. So from Linux Mint 8, you could install packages from the menu here just by uh, starting to type the suggestion of whatever the package was, and that would give a a simple apt get install command in the command line. You had support for NTFS file support, both read and write out of the box. And this was something that Ubuntu wasn't offering at the time. And they were able to introduce a software manager, uh, a, again, a continuation of the mint install tool. And this time they were able to introduce reviews and ratings to software. Now, while there wasn't a whole lot of icons or graphical pit bits of information to go by here, this was still leaps and bounds ahead of what a lot of other software managers were doing in 2009, integrating reviews and uh, view ratings so you could see how popular an app was, was pretty groundbreaking. If you couple with that, their featured application list, which gave users a very easy one-stop shop to install popular software of the day, and you were onto a winning Linux desktop. Uh, very positive reviews came out surrounding Linux Mint 8. And by this time, uh, Linux Mint was beginning to consolidate itself as, uh, as probably the fourth most popular operating system in the world after M Microsoft Windows, Apple Mac OS, and Ubuntu Linux. And this is what happens when open source software isn't changing all the time. It allows an untold level of spit and polish to happen on top. And this is where the story sort of starts to take a bit of a weird turn. While we had a very polished and pretty, I would argue for its time, uh, desktop in Linux Mint 8 and an expanding feature set, Thanks to all of the custom Mint tools, such as a backup tool, desktop configuration, domain blocker, file uploader, update manager, and upload manager, all of which had received significant polish over the last couple of years. Uh, we now get to the weird chapter in Linux's history where everyone decided to change everything. And that leads us onto the first long-term support release that used the Cinnamon desktop, Linux Mint, 13. So Linux Mint 13 was based on Ubuntu 12.04 and it came out in 2012 and it was uh, it was actually the follow up of a very confused Linux Mint release in the release cycles before. Uh, but eventually the team at Linux Mint decided to prioritize the voice of their users and their community feedback to create an alternative to GNOME Shell and to Ubuntu's Unity in the form of the Cinnamon desktop. Uh, now, Linux Mint 13 launched with Cinnamon 1.4, as well as a custom login manager, as well as a much improved software manager, complete with a lot more graphical elements to make icons really pop and make reviews and ratings, featured categories, etc., uh, really stand out. Also giving it an independent background daemon, so it would be able to install applications independent of what the rest of the system was doing. 
And this time, apart from just getting rave reviews about being a well-polished Linux distribution, this time people actually came flocking to Linux Mint because of the, uh, the abrupt changes that had been introduced in other Linux desktops, including those shipping with GNOME 3 and those shipping with Ubuntu Unity. The sheer fact that Linux Mint was able to provide such a relatively polished experience that still operated on a traditional desktop paradigm was a godsend for a lot of Linux users. Not only were they developing Cinnamon, which would obviously be available on other Linux distributions as well, they were also inputting a lot of development effort into Mate, which was the fork of GNOME 2 after GNOME 2 project was abandoned. And now we fast forward to Mint 17. Mint 17 was the first Linux Mint release that marked the beginning of their new long-term support strategy. Up to this point, Linux Mint had delivered a brand new Linux Mint release every six months following the release cadence of its Ubuntu parent. But funnily enough, they just found the development cycle a bit too hectic and found that it would be much more worth their while to build uh, new features and include them in kind of service pack releases on top of a long-term support base. So with Ubuntu 14.04 coming out, they introduced a an updated Mate desktop, an updated Cinnamon desktop. Oh, and by the way, I feel like it's worth mentioning that Linux Mint up to this point also was providing an XFCE desktop, a KDE based desktop, and they'd also started experimenting with the Linux Mint Debian edition. And I just wanna point these things out because as you can see, Linux Mint has grown to a full fledged uh, ginormous project at this point. Multiple versions, multiple desktops, there's a lot going on. So in Mint 17, uh, the update manager again got some really great improvements in terms of uh, granular control, again giving the user the control they were looking for. It got a lot easier for people to uh, install drivers uh, when they weren't connected to the internet. This became really important for anyone who had had Broadcom wireless chips back in the day because you couldn't install uh, anything from the internet if you didn't have internet to begin with. They really improved multi-monitor support with their Cinnamon release as well as high pixel density displays. Moving forward, the Linux Mint team would now focus on releasing service packs uh, every so often to support their long-term support release. And when we fast forward two more releases, we arrive at what is the current Linux Mint release due for its first uh, quote unquote service pack updates. 19.1 uh, will be due around Christmas time uh, of this year at the time of the recording of this video. And, uh, and Linux Mint 19 really solidifies its place uh, as, the, as the community driven user voice input uh, Linux distribution. And I think if we look back over its 10 plus years on the Linux desktop, uh, the Linux Mint team have ve been very, very consistent. Uh, not once have they completely uh, thrown out their previous projects or completely overhauled. It's been iterative from the start, and that has led to a, a level of polish and overall focus that is very rarely seen in a lot of projects these days. Linux Mint 19 introduced TimeShift and they are doing major work behind the scenes to really scale up the impact that TimeShift can have on the Linux desktop in uh, Linux Mint 19.1. They also overhauled the software center again uh, in the 0.3 release in 18.3. Uh, of uh, the previous long-term support release, and that included Flatpak support so that they could uh, install independent, more universal apps. And obviously that debuted uh, in 18.3, but made its way to Linux Mint 19 as well. Uh, again, high pixel density displays where the support for that was improved yet again. And also there was a lot of work done to tighten up the performance of the Cinnamon uh, desktop and the Cinnamon window manager, as well as all of the other apps that are now considered native to the Cinnamon desktop. And just as a point of reference for scale again, uh, now Linux Mint holds uh, the number two spot on DistroWatch in terms of how popular, in terms of clicks per day on their site it is. Uh, in terms of how many users there are, it's kind of tough to tell, but if their donations and sponsorships are anything to go by, where Linux Mint uh, in its first few 
uh, years was around uh, 500 to 1,000 bucks a month in donations and sponsorships. They're now sitting at, uh, at well over $10,000 in uh in sponsorships and donation which uh which fuel the massive development effort that is uh the mate desktop the cinnamon desktop the uh the linux mint debian edition and all of the features that that are pouring into this distribution and i think the linux mint team uh a lot of that success is owed to their very focused approach to providing a user-friendly community-based distribution that honestly listens to the needs of its users and adapts accordingly. So what do you think of Linux Mint? What was the first release that you ever tried and what was your impression of it? I know Linux Mint isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I dare say that a lot of us, when we first started out with Linux, appreciated the work and spit and polish that Linux Mint put into its distributions because I can safely say that I probably wouldn't be using Linux as much as I am today if it weren't for this project. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think in the comments below and I will catch you all in the very next video. Peace out, ladies and gentlemen.